Welcome to our second episode of the Artsakh podcast featuring Kevis Kajian, Executive Director of ANC Artsakh, and myself, Hago Pipjan, Advisor to the President of the Republic of Artsakh. We will be your hosts. The aim of the podcast is shedding light on the ground realities and ongoing developments, and most importantly, continuing to share the stories of the resilient people of Artsakh. We are currently on day 258 of the blockade. So as we last spoke, uh, there have been some developments uh, in light of the uh, food rationing and the food scarcity. Unfortunately, this week we've seen uh, difficulties with the water supply. So not only do people stand in lines for hours just to get bread in Artsakh, but they've begun to do the same uh, for, wa- for water across the city. Um, additionally, uh, we will be getting into this subject throughout this podcast, but we've seen some movement on the foreign diplomatic field in light of a reported resolution uh, by the French delegation and some statements by the Canadian foreign minister, which I'm sure Hagop and Mr. our guest today, Mr. Babayan, will be getting into. Uh, until yesterday, a total of 728 patients had been relocated from Arsakh to Armenia to access necessary, necessary medical treatment. The International Committee of the Red Cross facilitated this process, and an additional 70 patients received treatment with the assistance of Russian peacekeepers. Notably, ICRC operations were halted for nearly a month in May. Although they resumed, they faced interruptions and suspended again on June 10, and then recommenced on June 25, facing challenges once more on July 29, following the abduction of Vagif Khachadrian, Operations resumed on August 8. No individuals could travel without hindrance along Stepanagert Goris Highway, the Lachin Corridor. The instances of bi-directional movement plummeted by around 213-fold. Movement was only possible with the assistance of the Red Cross and Russian peacekeepers. This occurred in contrast to the expected 629,650 people moving in the 257 days, reducing it to only 2,951 entries and exits. During the blockade, Azerbaijan wholly or partially interrupted the sole gas supply into Artsakh for a total of 190 days, and the electricity supply has been completely disrupted for 228 days. This has led to daily blackouts and an additional emergency shutdowns resulting in many facilities closing or curtailing operations. Today, we're honored to have Mr. David Babayan on the show with a remarkable career, ranging from Foreign Minister of Artsakh to Advisor to the President. Mr. Babayan brings a wealth of geopolitical insights to our discussion. Stay tuned for an enlightening conversation on negotiations, geopolitics and more. Mr. Babayan, Thank you for accepting our invitation. Le Figaro this week reported that France is preparing a UN resolution of the Artsakh blockade. And we wanted to find out from, with your extensive experience in diplomacy and geopolitics, how do you foresee the dynamics playing out in the UN Security Council regarding France's proposed resolution on the Artsakh blockade? Thank you very much for inviting. I, I think that this format is a very interesting one. And I think it will be very much popular not only in Artsa, but also in Armenia, in diaspora. One thing which we have to strive for, to make a kind of a unified information field. Mm-hmm. You see, uh, it's a very difficult question indeed, talking about UN Security Council. On one hand, it's uh, very much uh, a positive development that the highest, actually, security forum of of the global geopolitics, the UN Security Council, considers the issue in Artsakh. Well, uh, from information point of view, from uh, humanitarian, sometimes from psychological point of view, it's, it's a positive development. On the other hand, it has also several very problematic issues. Because uh, we have to understand that in case of failure, it will have much more devastating effects than positive ones. Why? Because if nothing is accepted, if no concrete step has been taken, Mm. then the Azerbaijani and Turkish bloc and all the forces assisting them will be much more resolute. They will intensify. Definitely. It will embolden them because it gives them a green light 
to yes. continue what they're doing. Yes, right? and they can actually demonstrate that their actions are unpunishable. Without consequences. Without any consequences. And this kind of, uh, you know, uh, stance of international community, passive mm. in that case, only uh, some, I don't know, uh, verbal conversations, some kind of appeals, toasts, this are not going to work in that situation because we need some very bold and concrete yeah. actions to somehow contain aggression. Hagop and I were actually talking about this throughout the week of what our expectations were for the UN Security Council. And the biggest fear was that whatever happens, it's better uh, to uh, not get a resolution that gets voted down than to take our time and pass something that, that would have some type of ramification. Because as you said, if we put something forth on the floor and it gets rejected, uh, it not only is a bad outcome, but it sets us backwards. Right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, needing nine votes, you know, to get any vetoes or any, you know, to get the resolution through, it's going to be really hard for us, even for our friends. You know, and the without countries a that, video, you need yeah, nine yeah, votes and yeah. none of the five permanent members making a video. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be really hard for us to be able to find that friends that we that we should have. Uh, around yeah, the world you know, to kind of get us that. And, and if I can add, and I can speak bluntly, I, I don't think that the Armenian Foreign Ministry is of at capacity to even get something like that done, which is why I also think that uh, the French resolution that's being reported is important because they have some type of geopolitical cachet. Um, and I think uh, the goal here is to define our parameters. So if they can pass a resolution that brings in humanitarian aid at the very least, I think it's a positive step forward. Yeah, it's a positive, probably the minimum uh, outcome. But anyway, we need not only humanitarian steps, but political ones. Yeah. Because what's happened in Artsakh is a challenge to international law, to uh, all the moral principles. Mm -hmm. You see, it's an act of aggression, not only against Artsakh, but against international law, norms and principles. And if this transforms into some kind of, let's say, personal, individual uh, step of France or initiative of Paris, well, it's, it's okay, it's very good, but we have to also calculate, first of all, outcomes, possible outcomes of those things. And the most important thing is that the enemy is calculating it's also working not to allow any resolution mm -hmm. be adopted, especially a binding one. So it's a uh, very difficult situation, and we have to be uh, at least, uh, first of all, work very hard yeah. in advance because preparation is a key factor here. And also think what happened if something goes wrong. Yeah, prepare for the next scenario steps planning. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and that's something on a geopolitical field we need to do. In statecraft, we need to do. It's something that we speak about often. Of, uh, you know, uh, as much as uh, we don't give credit to the Azeris, they think everything through. They yeah, think there are a few if steps ahead. X moves here, then this is our, you know, mm -hmm, resulting mm -hmm. action. This yeah. is our result, and we have to do the same. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, bringing us to the next question, uh, Melanie Jolly, the Canadian Foreign Minister, earlier this week said it is important that Canada play a very important diplomatic role in the region, particularly Armenians facing a real threat in Artsakh. Regarding this commitment, how do you believe non-EU member states like Canada can effectively contribute to peacekeeping efforts and diplomatic discussions in our area? You see, it's a, also a positive statement, but... Uh, we need some, indeed, concrete steps. Because Canada, for example, is a state which provides some software for Bayraktar drones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that, uh, and also our diaspora organization, organizations also worked in that direction to ban the export of software yeah. and some parts to, of, yeah, for the to Bayraktar. Bayraktar. Yes, mm -hmm. but recently they decided to resume that. Yes. So... Uh, it's a very good statement, but we need some concrete steps. Let them again ban this kind of supply. It will be very positive thing, palpable, 
We need punitive measures is, is what you're referring to. Some, some tangible action that shows that Azerbaijan cannot continue business as usual. Because we see this all the time, uh, whether it's from the French delegation or, or Canadian or uh, partners throughout the EU. Very strong statements. Uh, standing with the people of Artsakh, but when it comes to uh, you know the requisite action uh, that's needed, we don't get anywhere. And I and I think now more than ever, it's important for those specific nations, whether it's Canada or France, that are making those statements, to be the first to take action because I think it's like a floodgate. Uh, no one else is taking punitive measures because they're waiting to see another geopolitical player take that action, put a sanction. I think once we get the first, the second becomes much more easy. Yeah, I think, you know, it's not the time for this romantic, uh, you know, comments or, you know, we statements. We don't need well wishes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Enough, enough with this. What we need, as you both stated, is concrete steps. We need concrete steps because we're, you know, at this point of time, uh, we're on the verge of, you know, losing what we have. So we need solid steps from the international community and uh, you know those need to be punitive measures against Azerbaijan and uh, one of the statements that you know you've made previously you know Artsakh can never be in Azerbaijan you know uh, never and never you know the, we need to forget about that it's not going to happen definitely you see because there is uh, only one outcome of such scenario there will be no Artsakh mm. And uh, we have to understand this because we live in a, uh, indeed in a biblical period of our history. Mm -hmm. If we lose Artsakh, then it will be a process, a kind of a domino effect, and we will start to uh, actually disintegrate as a state, as a yeah. nation. And uh, it's probably the most serious challenge we face, even uh, more serious than the 1915 genocide. Because after 1915 genocide, which was a devastating blow, a catastrophe for Armenian people, but some part of Armenian historical land remained, and some population remained in, in historical land. And la it later became uh, Soviet Armenia or Republic of Armenia, Artsakh to some extent. Now, we have to understand that it will be the end of Armenian yeah. state with that all. When it comes to Artsakh, uh, I think it's important to categorize that independence is not a preference for us. It is a prerequisite to our existence. Uh, there Absolutely. is no Artsakh that is not an independent Artsakh, that is not a free Artsakh, because anything else, like you said, is the open road to ethnic cleansing and the existential end of this land and this nation. I think, uh, you know, what Artsakh means for the Armenian people, you know, it's a signal of uh, hope, it's a signal of pride, you know, there's a lot of things that come with it. It's not just, uh, you know, a piece of land. Artsakh, Artsakh is a lot more for the Armenian people. And I think, you know, if that, if we, you know, yeah. lose Artsakh, we, we're losing that pride. And, and we see the preparation of uh, what is to come if we lose Artsakh. Today, if anyone is to follow Azerbaijani propaganda or media closely, one term they'll use all the time is Western Azerbaijan. And they have their eyes set on Sunik, and the, soon they will have it on the other Marses of Armenia and, and eventually Yerevan. And this isn't some like alarmist, nationalist Armenian take. This is the game plan that not only are we predicting, but we are seeing play out every single day. Azerbaijan is openly, and yeah. they're openly, unapologetically mm -hmm. stating mm -hmm. this. Yes, it's, it's this the reality. Besides, without Artsakh, the disintegration of Armenian nation will start in a very dramatic pace. Why? Because, first of all, if you voluntarily uh, somehow, you know, reject part of your nation, mm. you s consider this not to be part of Armenian not Republic of Armenia, but Armenia, you know, the Armenian nation, Armenian at, large. nation mm -hmm. at large. Then, for example, the Artsakh segment, primarily, and this is the first step, this segment, which is quite large in number, I mean, around one million people mm. living in Artsakh, some part of Armenia, and also Northern Caucasus in Russia, they will feel alienated from Armenian people because they will feel that 
this kind of a betrayal or refusal. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, something which is which will be a very strong blow. Then part of Armenian citizens, Armenian population, will consider this to be something shameful, a betrayal. Normal people, pa- patriotic people, the diaspora will be also alienated from that kind of state. Mm. You see, and after that, taking Western Azerbaijan, uh, I don't know, Eastern Zangezur or whatever, will be just a matter of technique mm. in a very short period of time because the, uh, the, the apple will be already rotten and it will fall down. You corrode the people and corrode, their identity yes, and yes, mindset identity, first. Everything will be yeah. actually eroded d- totally and you don't have to spend much, mu- much time uh, a lot of resources buying tanks, drones, I don't know, whatever, uh, securing international alliances. No, it will be already ready for taking. I think Artsakh is that thing that, you know, unifies the whole Armenian nation. Yeah. It brings everyone together. It brings, you know, regardless of political parties, regardless of understandings, regardless of anything, Artsakh. And I think, you know, this is what we saw in the diaspora in the, during the war. We saw everyone coming together, you know, in the yeah. U.S., in uh, Cyprus, and in different countries, everyone came together, unified for one purpose, and that was Artsakh. And I think, like the the preservation of Artsakh, isn't just about the preservation of Artsakh; it's the preservation of Armenia, and then even largely on, on a bigger scale, it's the preservation of Armenianness. It, it is what it does it mean to be Armenian? What is our existential future? Who are we as a people? And are we going anywhere? Uh, will we make it into the future? And it starts here. Uh, we cannot concede uh, Artsakh because we would be conceding parts of our own selves. You are uh, perfectly right because we have also to take into consideration a very important aspect of Armenian history and Armenianness. We have kind of a very strong complex of inferiority. Why? Because after the 1915 genocide, this complex started to penetrate into all our, you know, senses, mind, heart, because we were crashed. Mm. And we saw that we were unable to defend ourselves because uh, uh, entire people asking for some kind of mercy, for recognition of the genocide, because we are so weak, we have to uh, cry to somehow say, and it was the basis of maintaining Armenian identity in the diaspora, the memories of genocide, which is a victimizing idea. And the Artsakh National Liberation Movement, especially victories in the first and second wars, that pride back. started to somehow, you know, uh, erase this country. It became a matter of identity. Yes, yeah. and now yeah. nations with some complexes of inferiority, they have to be ideologically motivated. They have to to have a source of inspiration. Mm. And the Artsakh movement Mm. became this source. We started to get rid of this complex of inferiority Mm. because we not only demonstrated that we are able to defend ourselves from much stronger enemy, but also to defeat them. Mm. And if now we lose, then it will especially the propaganda of the enemies. Our will, concept of self. Yes, they will say you are unable. Mm. Well, uh, for some period of time, for t- some decades, you can do something, but you are unable to do anything because your nation is, is ill. Your nation is unable to achieve some mm. great accomplishments. And this is the way f- for assimilation because mm. especially young people will not be so happy to mm. associate themselves with a losing, yeah. Yeah. you know, weak unable people how do you how would you you know i think a a big uh, struggle that we have today is uh, on one hand and you work in the foreign diplomatic field this has been your career we need to be active there right we need to be active participant in in the geopolitical landscape to negotiate our rights to make our uh, stand on the nation of tables but at the same time we have to have a strong state right and how would you say those two things coincide because Oftentimes, I find myself saying, you know, we need this country to make this statement. We need this country to make this statement. But I'm never happy with the actions of the Armenian government itself. Uh, I don't think that we're always at par ourselves to then go and communicate to the rest of the world. Strength begins at home. And then we parlay that into political capital 
on the geopolitical field? You see, it's a, uh, actually, geopolitics is a very precise field. Mm. It's like a uh, calculation, it's like a mathematics, you see. And there are several key components which help overcome many difficulties. One is professionalism, of course, mm. and second is principal stance. Mm. Look how Turkey and Azerbaijan are waging their politics. Very principal stance. Well, of course, not acceptable to us, but we have to fix the reality. It's just dry facts and professional. We have principled, to, if I can, principled in their own interests. We're not talking on a moral scale. No, no, We're not no, no, talking no, 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 about no, no, anything. Definitely. Yes, and absolutely. It's a very good comment because now we have entered the era of naked geopolitics. Mm. And all those dresses, democracy, yeah, human yeah. rights, it's a, unfortunately, they have been thrown away. Mm. Naked geopolitics, interests. So we have to understand our potential, mm. what kind of geopolitical capital we have. How we are going to ca capitalize this? And you see, even in this difficult situation, we have quite a good geopolitical assets because the very existence of Artsakh does not allow reformatting mm -hmm. the geopolitical landscape of, of the Transcaucasus or Southern Caucasus. It's a very important asset, mm -hmm. but we have to play with that. If we don't play, we need to irrespective it. of the professional or moral levels, mm. or uh, you know, irrespective of understanding or misunderstanding the situation, the process will go on. So what we have to say that we have a great potential. Mm. This means that we, if we have this kind of potential, this kind of asset, as then we calculate which state is more vulnerable for reformatting the region and work with them mm. at the first hand. And then say, who have, among other states, some long-range interests? Parallel in, interests. Parallel interests. Yeah. And this is the way how to behave. If we are not, uh, you know, following the principal stance, I mean, they, you don't have any value moral, let's say. What can you expect from this kind of people? Nothing. So if you are very much strong, you say no, let's say it, there cannot be anything about the future of Artsakh within Azerbaijan, nobody is going to press you because they understand that your attitude could matter and could change the real balance of power here. Mr. Bamayan, say, on what you said, which are those countries at this moment of time? Who do we... Well, Whose interests co coincide, if you like, with We ours? have a very unique, indeed, geopolitical assets because we can maintain good relations with states who have bad relations among themselves. Mm. Why? Because we are a diasporic nation. Mm. It's the greatest geopolitical asset. Only two people in the world have this kind of privilege, so to say, the Armenian people and Jewish people. Mm. So, it, this means that we can have and we must have very good, deep, fraternal relations with Russia, with U.S., with Iran. Mm -hmm. Just look at the spectrum. I mean, states which have problems with each other, sometimes who uh, are even enemies. And we've done this in the past, right? This isn't a novel concept. Mm -hmm. This is no, foreign no, no. policy we've maintained so for it, years. I mean, nobody can... Uh, yeah. No, not many states can allow this kind of yeah. privilege. But if we don't do that, I mean, our society has been divided. There are anti-Russian segments, anti-Western. Yeah. Instead of being pro-Armenian and make kind of parallels, uh, you know, somehow uh, bring the ends together, yeah. this will be a very greatest thing. Because if, for example, just uh, let us talk in a very ordinary manner, if Russia or US being jealous, they may say, why you maintain good relations, for example, with US? We say, because we have two million Armenians there. They cannot argue. And if, uh, let's say, Washington will say, why you 
consider Russia to be a brotherly country. We say because there are three million Armenians. Mm -hmm. They cannot say anything. But we have to use that asset. You see, this means, again, patriotism and professionalism. Because if there are people who are not having these categories, these values among, among themselves, then... Everything will be I think in a bad oftentimes, especially recently, especially in a heated political landscape, people offer this uh, mutually exclusive concept of either you have good relations with your geopolitical allies or you have good relations with, let's say, the West. And I don't think that those are diametrically opposed. We need to, anyone that says that we shouldn't have strong diplomatic and, you know, brotherly relations with Uh, geopolitical nations, superpowers in this field, let it be Russia, let it be Iran, uh, have uh, absolutely no concept of how the caucuses work. And then those that say we have to, at the same time, completely shun the United States or Europe, where we have millions upon millions of Armenians, one, it, it doesn't help us in any sense, and also it disregards the actual human capital we have there. We can do much with our uh, political influence there, and we don't have to make them uh, be in opposition to each other. Exactly, yeah. and we have this privilege. For yeah. example, let's say Estonia mm. doesn't have such a potential. They have to choose. And with, uh, in our case, we have to understand that choosing between these kind of things could transform our country into a battlefield. It's the theater of geopolitical struggle, war. This will be a total catastrophe. Look what happened in Ukraine, yeah. what happened in other places. If they transform their country into the battlefield where the interests of gigantic states... You become a cr- battlefield for proxy wars. Definitely. You will be devastated. You mm-hmm. see, look, let's say... Just let us analyze Ukraine. This country had a huge potential, economic, intellectual, everything. Geographical location was perfect. In case they could keep a balance, Mm -hmm. having good relations with Russia, with West, becoming a bridge between them, between Turkey, Mm. uh, Northern Europe, West, Russia, this country would become a hub, Mm. geopolitical. Instead, they became a battlefield. So we have to understand that we have, it's a, it's a very unique thing. We can capitalize this, mm. but instead we do everything to become a battlefield. Right. This is something unbelievable. Mm. Mr. Bavayan, okay, bringing to my next, question, my next question, why have we failed to do so? What, what are the reasons? What's the understanding? Why, why is the Armenian government choosing, you know, to take us towards the route of becoming a battlefield rather than, you know, being able to capitalize or monetize our location and you know being able to kind of bring peace to to the area you see it's a probably most difficult thing i think that this issue this question even our greatest sons or fathers of armenian nation could not answer that there is something within armenian people which, I mean, it's, it's a hyper-energetic people. And the level of internal competition is very high. Mm. This is the problem. You know, in, in biology, we have internal competition and you have external. Some species have to compete with other species, for example, lions with hyenas or whatever. But there is also inter-species competition within. So I think that there is something within us which we cannot somehow control this competition. Look how Armenians develop in other countries. The same is very difficult in the motherland. I think that this is a very profound question. This is the key to our success. Look at our mythology. I mean, Muhir entered the cave and said, I cannot sustain what's happened. I cannot see all those injustices thousands of years ago. You see? What happened if, for example, in a very ancient times, even the Sumerian people, one of the cradles of human civilization, considered Armenia to be a pattern of uh, you know, kindness, of law, 
of everything, something which everybody had to adore. And what happened when you see the history of Armenian people by Mofsis Khorinazi, when you see the chapters about the loss of Armenian kingdom, when you r just read what's going on and what was going on at that time, exactly the same as now. What happened and where? I mean, this is a, a long-term strategy which we have to, I mean, the, the strong state, patriotic state, has to also allocate a lot of resources to study this because this could be a cue for our survival. But we don't have time now for this kind mm -hmm. of things. Now we have to just solve a very concrete steps. But what you said, this is a very profound thing which we have to study and analyze. We have a great potential intellectual, both in, in motherland, in diaspora. We have to combine them. We have to study whether there is difference in inter-Armenian competition in the diaspora or, or in Armenia, why there, is, uh, there are differences, what kind of differences, in order to understand the key of this disease. Mm. But, you know, to, to a certain degree, I wish that hyper-competitiveness that, that we talked about would result, at least on a level of governance, in a meritocracy. Uh, and I'm going to say this bluntly. Today, I don't think the people that are uh, one in charge of the diplomatic negotiation process, uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the Armenian foreign ministry through time, through the decades, and we've had amazing, brilliant professionals in those fields. That's something I don't see today. Uh, and unfortunately, today I see folks that make statements to appease foreign powers, uh, to appease some of our enemies sometimes. And if you guys paid attention this last week, on the 33rd anniversary of Armenia's independence, uh, even the prime minister of Armenia himself came out and said that uh, we need to be uh, careful with this rhetoric of independence because it might, uh, you know, upset our enemies. Uh, that type of rhetoric, one, I don't think it builds confidence in your own people. And, and two, I, I don't think you, you show the type of capacity needed at any juncture, but especially this one. This is, as you stated correctly, Mr. Babayan, one of the most important times in our history. So much of the past and so much of the future will be hinged upon what we do now. And now we need the best, the brightest, and the most Armenian-centric people leading us forward. Yeah, I think um, Mr. Babayan in another interview uh, back when he was a foreign minister, he said Artsakho-centric. I really like that mm. uh, for me, that's, you know, uh, it stuck to me as soon as I heard that. And, you know, I've mentioned it a few times. And I think Armenia's foreign policy, okay, one of the most important things needs to be Artsakho-centric. Because we do, you know, we've, we have an asset, as you both said. And I believe we need to mm. use that asset. And you know? Artsakh is the beginning and end of our existential future. Is it, uh, guys, uh, the problem is the following. Look, when you are a very uh, principle, you have principle stance and you are a great professional and patriot, it will work for a very positive, you know, results. Mm -hmm. Look what, I mean, f at the beginning and the most important thing is to study from enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that if tomorrow we will have some kind of peace or whatever, we have to study Turkish diplomacy. We this talk will about be this all yeah. the time. Yeah. I mean, there are various schools of geopolitical struggle, like there are martial arts. There is Turkish school, Western, Jewish, Chinese. Mm -hmm. You see, these are the probably the best, the, the one, yeah. of the most, the strongest schools of geopolitical struggle. Russian school, etc. But these four are a very strong one. So, the first visit after being re-elected. President Erdogan paid to Turkish Cyprus. His first visit. and Northern when, Cyprus. Northern Cyprus. Now they, by the way... <laughs> He's a Cypriot. So. I know, I know. But you see, they changed the name. Mm -hmm. Now it's not a Northern, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. It's Turkish Republic of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. And recently, Dovlet Bahçevi, mm -hmm. or what he said, mm -hmm. Cyprus is Turkey. Mm -hmm. I mean, and... This is the, the most important thing, how they behave. 
And you, you saw these kind of meetings, the flags of Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, Turkey, everything. The format was totally... They started with Famagusta. The first day was in Famagusta. Yes, yes, and, you know, yes. it was the most provocative, um, you know, move that they could do. Because yes. by UN, that should have been a dead zone. Mm. And they opened the city. And to, you know, to top it all off, they've put a Bayraktar base there as well. So that's completely. Yes. And then a few, a few weeks later, they announced that, you know, we're not enemies with Greece, you know, just to patch up things. And, you know, their foreign policy, um, excuse me, but it's on T. They know what they're yeah. doing, you know. And uh, I always say we need to respect our enemies. They're steps ahead from us. And look, even even some signs, some very, let's say, technical things, but they're with deep meaning. So the invasion of Turkish army into Cyprus, mm. the operation was called Attila. Mm -hmm. the, the, one of the famous you know, Mongols, yeah, yeah. yeah. Until the, the, the Han, it's the yeah. Han, yes. Yeah. The Bayraktars, Gazil Elma, one of the now the the recent development, Gazil Elma, which is a red apple, is a symbol of the conquest of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. See, and everything because they value even the change of name, you know, from Turkey to Turkey. Yes, know, so, yes. so you see everything and. If we don't follow this path, if we follow, we are very much principled, we are patriotic, everybody will pay attention and nobody will say, okay, you have recognized Artsakh part of Azerbaijan. How can you do that? I mean, it's something unbelievable. You know, we're talking about changing our coat of arms. You know, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Well, you know, they're doing everything to maintain their Look, national identity. When, when and we're doing everything about, to lose our national yes, identity. Yes, we can talk about that. We don't have lions, for example, now, no. But... Let, let's take the, the uh, court of arms of uh, UK. They have a unicorn. It's something... <laughs> mythological. Myth yeah, yeah. mythological. You guys really... Yeah. <laughs> and, yes, I didn't know that. and they have lion too. And you don't have lions in, in British Isles you know, for many thousands of years. But symbolism, especially we have some kind of symbol, which is it's a universal, it's a the Mount Iron, oh, no, no. which is a biblical symbol. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have presence in Jerusalem, one of the one of the most important. So Same, very few, then very few, a few belong to us. Mm -hmm. It means, and we have to, because we are a nation which inspires from such kind of things. We have to cultivate these kind of things. And I think, and I think that's why we're seen as a threat because they know that you know, if ever Armenians, you know, wake up and come together, yeah. you know, we can be a formidable... This is a very crucial thing, you see, because they understand that mm. it's impossible to defeat Armenians yeah. from outside, but from inside. You have to corrode mm. it yeah. from the inside. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's you know, a very... Well, you people, with the bad apple as well. When people ask me what is the uh, biggest pain that you have, and I would say it's also my biggest hope, the gap between where we are and where we can be, and who we can be is so large. So in, in some degree, to see yourself in, in this predicament, it's very difficult. But in another degree, if you look at the what potential. it means to be yeah. Armenian and the potential that we have on a global field in centers of the, of the earth that are the most important places that, you know, geopolitically, economic, whatever it may be, our potential is through the roof. And it is about finding leadership and instilling the cultural and identity values in people to bridge that gap of who we are and who we can be. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that you know we've spoken before. It's like geopolitically, we we're in a very good place to be. Um, you know, we, we Silk Road. If you know, let's take it historically. Even even the treaties before the war that they were signed. You know that they wanted the pipelines to pass from Iran to from Armenia and etc. You know all those things. They they put us in a really good place to be, but we don't know how to utilize that. We don't know how to use that potential, even uh, you know historically and also uh, as as a trade nation and etc. You know economically and everything. We don't know how to utilize it now. See Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has become you know slowly is becoming you know an energy you know uh, um, supplier to the West. Yeah. 
And slowly, it's, you know, the deals that they're signing, even the deals that they signed, late, uh, signed lately with Hungary yeah. and et cetera, if you, if you see what, what they're doing, it's like, because, you know, I, most of my time I read about, you know, what they do because we yeah. need to be informed. It's, it's amazing. And it goes to Mr. Babayan's point about uh, what was it, naked geopolitics, right? Out in the open. Uh, today... There is no EU country that doesn't know that Azerbaijan uh, brings in Russian energy exports into their country and then also uh, pushes out their own domestic exports onto the EU market. And they do that to supplant one another. Everybody knows what's going on and they let them do it because interest today on the global scale and maybe interest always have always yeah. spoken up louder than any of these perceived principles that, that we talk about. And this is Look a game Africa, that they yes. play. Yeah, and this is a game that they play out in the open. There is no concealment. Yes, but uh, let us also s- analyze some uh, differences. L- look, Azerbaijan is capitalizing its geographical position mm. and natural resources. Mm. We have much more important soft power component, which they lack, mm. because they can transport some oil, gas from Russia, from other countries, make some money. This is their source of geopolitical capitalism. But they don't have a lobby, a diaspora. They don't have this kind of uh, soft power, which yeah. can balance, which can bring energy, I don't know, geopolitical, political assistance. This is why their main target is to destroy our soft power within yeah. identity our morale you see our values because without that mm. from pure let's say material point of view we are much much weaker and this rift between the diaspora and the homeland which unfortunately the armenian government today is aiding in that process of of making it seem like we aren't one unified nation across the globe but there is this discrepancy yeah i think uh, moving away from the traditional you know yeah, yeah. Uh, being political and parties we, or the church yes, yeah. we have to understand that this is a, an immense power yeah because we can have this this kind of i don't know strong positions within you see armenia will be never in in foreseeable future be able to defend in material terms itself from, let's say, Turkey or Azerbaijani combined attack. But because we have soft power, we can balance and this aggression will never happen. Mm. You see, this kind of potential, neither Turkey nor Azerbaijan possess this kind of potential. But do you think this is guided by other foreign entities, like, for example, Israel? Because if you look at how Israel, you know, uh, dealt with Palestine... Well, definitely many countries are, have been involved in this politics. And this is natural because their, their interests, existential interests, are also somehow here too. Mm. But it means that instead of blaming somebody, we have to learn from them mm. how they are going to do that, how they are playing these games. And uh, this is something very important because we have also very substantial presence both in Israel and Palestine. We can use that. Armenian people uh, are very talented. I mean, our, our compatriots, they can learn Hebrew, Arabic, different languages. And you see, can you imagine what kind of potential we have without investing much resources? Mm. For example, Azerbaijan, how they are going to learn Hebrew or Arabic? Only, you know, investing money from oil, I don't know, bringing some uh, teachers, professors, whatever. But we have their people who... We have the human capital. Human capital. Mm -hmm. For whom, let's say, Arabic or Hebrew can be a mother tongue. tongue. Millions of people. We already have. With with Armenian, Armenian, yes. You see what kind of... how, How much strength we possess in case of correct utilization of this capital. This is why we have to understand this. The most... What kind of potential do we have? And diaspora, Armenia, Artsakh, they should be and must be together. Yes, with all the drawbacks, problems within, but (laughs) if we construct, Hmm. let's say, a correct path. National agenda. National agenda, yes. It will help, especially in a long-term perspective. Hmm. 
our country and state will be transformed in something unbelievable now. Mm. Also, we have to understand one thing. Well, geopolitics, of course, is a very hard thing, but there are things which cannot be calculated because we are a people with some kind of divine mission. Indeed, it's not something just words. I mean, uh, this is why we see, we are always the first in many places, adopting Christianity, you know, first who crashed this Babylonian tower or whatever. And now we see a mini biblical thing which happened. Gutan said, happen. said that we are the shock troops between light and darkness. To some extent, yes. Yeah. And this is why we will overcome these difficulties. But Mr. Babayan, uh, you see, we always do the same mistake, though. We look for messiahs. We look for people that, you know, we're going to follow and we're going to drop behind them and, you know, put ourselves, you know, give our everything towards one person rather than the idea, rather than the understanding, rather than, you know, that cultural shift. I think we it's not an absence of leadership uh, at times. It's uh, sometimes we have to look inwards. Uh, and some of the biggest changes... I. You guys know my political uh, opinions. I, I think we need changes in the leadership and in the governance of Armenia, but we need changes culturally because whatever exists today, we allow to exist to a certain degree. Yes, but you see what uh, when you talk about Messiah, there is a very profound problem here because we do wait for such people, but the problem is that we make false gods of them. Mm -hmm. This is why we always face catastrophe. Not always, but many times. Because Messiah is something else. It's, it's patriotism, it's professionalism, it's unity, it's energy. But when you make him a false god, it's corruption, it's misunderstanding, it's lack of patriotism, it's demagogy, it's everything. You see, this is the problem. So uh, it means that education is very important for our mm. people. Uh, and... Uh, a lot of things which state has to do. But if state is in a very difficult condition, this is the problem. And I think, uh, you know, adding, you know, to what you said as well, Kev, we, I think we did that same mistake with, uh, you know, the prime minister now in Armenia. But for me, my understanding is it's the idea. We need to follow an idea. We need to go through, um, you know, something. In Armenian, we say karapar. For me, you know, and... I've, I've said it before, we need to love our race, first of all. We need to love our nation. And I think the absence of that will, has brought us to where we are today. Um, now I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, we've, we've gone off, off track. It's uh, basically President Macron, uh, you know, had an interview with Le Pont, uh, And President Macron said... He, he showed caution in adopting the term genocide um, on the ongoing situation, despite you know the, what uh, experts like former I, ICC prosecutor Luis Moreno Campos stated. How do you perceive this approach? Well, you see, we have to, uh, of course, follow all those developments, but never get into history. Hmm. We have to understand that if he doesn't want to use that word, then something is going on. We have to uh, just uh, get the, the correct diagnosis. What's going on? What was the reaction? Why it happened? Whether it's a Turkish, let's say, pressure, there is something else there. And uh, if we just get the indicators without, you know, making, let's say, noise, criticizing, blaming. This is also a very important thing. But after a correct diagnosis, why this happened? This is why we also need to somehow change uh, the philosophy of our dias diasporic activity. Mm -hmm. You see, because here we see already a great gap between reality and their actions. Why? Because this is something not in the, uh, it's not the fault of, let's say, people or diaspora organization or leadership. 
This is something which came from our nature. Because we always thought that ideas, morale, law, these are very norms, are very important. This is why the, the basis of our diaspora work was on that very foundation. This is right, uh, this is according to international law, this is justice, but we are in the era of naked geopolitics, which in that period, all those things doesn't work or have a very limited effect. So we have a very short period of time to change the philosophy of our action, like the Jewish diaspora does. They are not. They are using these norms, etc., this kind of soft power. But their main strategy is not that. So we have to uh, change that thing because if we don't, we, if we cannot adapt, then we will face much more difficult challenges in the in the future. I think. Look. I, I think that's a, a great point that we have to follow these uh, developments and diagnosticate accordingly. At the same time, I would also add that no foreign leader uh, is a uh, you know authority figure on either our history or our present. Uh, and because Macron or the president Over, from yeah. Mars or whoever else made a statement, uh, we cannot base our reality uh, on on those things. So. We work with our allies wherever they may be, but they do not define our reality at any point. Yeah, but I think it's interesting to look into why you know there was this. And I think the the, the coming weeks will tell. Yeah, we, we will we will see why, and then we can appropriately, with the right type of accountability, address that issue. Yeah. Well, I think this brings us to our end. Uh, I want to I want to extend heartfelt thank you, thank you for thank being you. with us. It's been a pleasure. A uh, special thank you goes to Artsakh TV, 301, and Artsakh Radio for providing us with this platform to have this important conversation. To all our listeners, we sincerely appreciate your time and attention. We want to let you know we're committed to continuing this podcast journey, shedding light on the ground realities and ongoing developments, and most importantly, continuing to share the stories of the resilient people of Artsakh. Stay tuned for more episodes as we embark on this journey together. And you guys can find us anywhere podcasts are found, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Apple, and even our YouTube and uh, Facebook pages. Uh, continue this journey with us. Continue having these really in-depth, amazing conversations like the one that we had uh, with uh, Mr. Babayan today. Um, and stay with us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.